So I'd like to just start by welcoming everybody. Um, I'm so happy to have this opportunity for The World As It Could Be and Voice of Witness to do this collaboration around understanding your work particularly, but also just its connection to the world of human rights. And our focus really is on that work. And we're using this idea of four questions at a time, this idea that there are these, we'll start with four and see where that leads us in terms of better understanding the, the work that you're about. Um, so we'll start just with that, which is just what is the work carried out by Voice of Witness and who is involved in this? All of us, all of us talk about our work quite often in various workshops and trainings and, and events, but um, I, can, I can start us off and then please, uh, Ella, Aaron, jump in. Um, but Voice of Witness is a nonprofit and the, the mission of, of Voice of Witness is to uh, advance human rights by amplifying the voices of people who are directly impacted by and fighting against injustice. And we do that through uh, two main programs, an oral history book series, um, which has right now, I think we're up to 22 titles in the oral history book series and looking at human rights crises, social justice issues around the world. Um, and for the past couple of years, and this is how I think it really directly intersects with, uh, with the UDHR, and we can get into this uh, a little bit later, is our core program areas around migration, displacement, and the criminal justice system in the United States. Um, but our books also cover just a wide range of topics, including you know, migration, displacement, criminal justice, immigration, public housing, uh, people who are displaced by violence, um, undocumented American workers, just a real vast array of social justice issues and, and human rights issues. Um, and so that's our oral history book series. And our other main program is our education program. And through the education program, we create free downloadable curriculum for every book in the series that has a real social justice focus, um, really uh, resonates with articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, in addition to really supporting uh, language learners and multilingual learners um, for our what we call our narrator community students, basically the communities that uh, where our stories are coming from uh, for the oral history book series. Um, we also have a whole array of resources for teachers and students um, that support them amplifying their own unheard voices and creating their own storytelling and oral history projects, in addition to consulting with nonprofits, school districts, and universities uh, at this point around the world. And so that's just kind of a thumbnail sketch, but I'm, I'm sure I might've missed something. So Aaron, Ella. I think I just wanna tackle the, you know, who is involved in this work question. We are a very small nonprofit. We are currently a team of 10, mix of full-time and part-time. So we are all involved in different departments. You know, it's a lot of collaboration in our organization. But beyond that, I think we really wanna highlight that our narrators, the people who share stories in our books, they're also involved in this work. You know, the way we capture their stories in oral history is meant to feel like a partnership and a collaboration so that they feel ownership over the story they're about to tell us. They feel involved in the book launch and where it goes into the world. They have their own copies to share with their loved ones. And they come back and work with us on events and workshops as guest speakers and sharing you know, their experiences beyond what we were able to capture in the book. So I really think about them when I think about who does this work. And you know, of course, the community partners that Ella really coordinates as her role is building all these relationships with other organizations who are doing really on the ground advocacy work for these communities. And so they're alongside us in this journey. And then all of the educators and students who are experiencing these stories, not just once they're done, but they're also part of us, you know, part of the process for us in creating our curriculum in looking over our lesson plans and thinking, does this work for my students? Would this work in my classroom? Is this something I want to use? Is this something we need to talk about right now? So while our team feels really small in the specific organization, I think the actual people doing this work extends into our greater network of narrators, educators, activists, practitioners, and everyone who just wants to spread oral history. To add to that, I think another key group who is 
part of this work are our readers too. Um, I think the folks who are also, you know, bearing witness to these stories, whether they themselves are part of the narrator communities or maybe not part of the narrator communities, but all the folks who engage and read the narratives that are in our books, I think are very much, we see them as part of this, this work um, as well and part of recognizing injustice and listening to narrators. Um, I think we really believe in the transformative power of the story and how it's transformative for both the storyteller, the narrator, and also the reader, the listener. And you may have touched on this, I, but in terms of getting your books out, how, how do you distribute the books? I mean, what, and what means, how, who are the different audiences that are likely to get the books. I think we can start with mentioning that um, we, our publisher is Haymarket Books, um, which is like a, as we have described them as a social justice focused um, publishing house. It's based out of Chicago. And so um, a lot of, you know, they're kind of our, our first point of contact, they're our publisher. And so they really share the book and the voice of witness, the books in the voice of witness series um, with a lot of their readers who are folks who are really interested in social justice issues, particularly around the themes that are, our books touch on, migration, displacement, the justice system in the US. So I think that's one of our key audiences. Um, we also work a lot with, with educators, teachers, um, and so the books are, are spread through, through them and through the different schools and districts that we work with and from them, the different students that they work with. Um, we also have, you know, our robust communications department who works on, on, you know, spreading the word about our books and we do different events where we partner with like a, a local partner perhaps or, um, you know, invite another, a, like a, a, someone from a community partner to talk um, about like how our work can really connect to like the advocacy that people are, are doing on the ground. So there's a lot of different ways that we try to, to raise awareness for our books. I, I'm sure I kind of missed a few, but there's a lot of different audiences we try to reach out to. And I think yeah. too, Ella, just, just to add on to what um, a lot of the work that you're doing, um, a lot of uh, how we're spreading the word about our work is through our community partners and the partners that Ella is working with. And it's a series of you know, social justice organizations, advocacy organizations, uh, art organizations that have a social justice focus. It's like the more that that net network gets built, the, the, the stronger our signal is in terms of boosting and, and getting the word out about, about our books and education program. And, and the different ways in which we partner. And I think one of the, the key things that I think binds all this together is that as an organization, we're deeply collaborative, uh, certainly with each other, but with the other organizations and, and uh, networks that we partner with, whether it's through education or community partnership or the book series itself, we're, we're very, very collaborative. We also have an ongoing free book program and we've historically really focused on making sure the title for that year goes to schools that have narrator communities within them. So for example, you know, with our Puerto Rico book recently called Mi Maria about Hurricane Maria, we really push the book out into communities where there's a high Puerto Rican population and even within Puerto Rico and trying to make sure those communities feel represented. And with the way things are going in the US, we are also working on figuring out, you know, can we set up an initiative to get the books in places where a book like ours might be banned and might need to fly under the radar? And how can we get the supply to a teacher who's going to navigate that in a way that doesn't get them in trouble, but can still get those stories to their students? And since, since this particular program started, this initiative, the Sharing History Initiative that Aaron mentioned, um, we've been able to place almost 9,000 copies of Voice of Witness books in, in classrooms and communities and community organizations around the country. To that end, how do you think, what are the different ways that the work you're doing actually touches the lives of the different people or groups of people who interact with Voice of Witness, including the readers? How, what, what are the various ways that this work has an impact on them. I think we can start with talking about our narrators who are you know, the folks that we really try to center throughout everything we do at Voice of Witness. And I think um, you know, our narrators, the process of, of sharing their story with the editor, editors of their book, um, being part of the Voice of Witness process, um, it's, it's, a, it's a long-term relationship and we really prioritize you know, their experience and their agency. And so it's over, you know, they're, they're so generous in, sharing their stories with all of us. Um, but I think narrators are also, you know, from what we heard from them, do get a lot out of the experience as well. For a lot of folks, this might be the first time that they've shared 
um, their story with someone, or maybe they've only shared it with a few people in their lives. It's not something that necessarily they talk about a lot, like very publicly before they're part of the Voice of Witness book series. So it's folks sharing, you know, some some very harrowing or potentially intense things that have happened to them, but also sharing their larger life story as well. They're not being defined by a single experience or by something that might be, you know, something really difficult. They're really getting to share all facets of who they are um, as a, as a three-dimensional person, their past, their present, their future, their goals for the future. So it's really a chance for narrators. Um, I think there's something very healing in the storytelling process for somebody to just sit down and share their story with another person, especially with one of the editors of our books who are, who are really engaged in this deep listening. So um, our narrators have shared that it's it's very healing to be able to share their story and to find, to really feel seen, you know, once, this, once the book comes out and being able to like hold like a physical copy of the book and see their story printed on the page can be can be very powerful and very moving for folks. So I think people, our narrators, it, it, they help, it helps them feel seen, it helps them feel like people do care about their story. And a lot of our narrators go, they go on to, 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 to you know, continue their advocacy and whether it's through their relationship with us and the events that we do and you know, being part of like our education advisory board, for example, or consulting on our curriculum or in other, like through our partners, they might continue their advocacy. Um, they really you know, speak out a lot for on um, behalf of their stories and for their communities. And I know something else that narrators bring up is that they really hope a main reason for sharing their story, even though it's often very difficult and, you know, how many times, no matter how many times they might share their story, it's always, you know, a challenging and emotional process. Um, they really want other people who might have a similar or connected story to feel seen as well and to inspire them to also, you know, feel empowered to speak up and to share their story. Um, whether that means just, you know, being seen or like speaking like in advocacy situations, whether it's like talking, telling the story in front of a Congress member or at a rally or in other ways, they really hope that other people will, will not feel alone, will feel comforted um, and also be inspired to share their story as well. How do you find the people that end up narrating or, you know, telling their story? How do you actually decide who those people will be or do they find you do you find them this is a tangent to the question but then we'll come back to who else is impacted now it, it kind of i mean it's it's a, a little bit of both of what you're saying um but what you're asking but we're we're in the process of really shifting um how particular projects come together and really taking a very 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 community centric approach and kind of working with our various partners and organizations and listening to them and what they need and what you know how this how this work might impact them or further their mission or further their goals around advocacy or social justice or education um and so i think making you know ella was talking about relationships and all of our work is about building relationships. And so through those relationships and what we call sort of the circle of trust, uh, creating with various organizations, nonprofits, advocacy groups, educators, um, able to connect with partners that and, and individuals that have an interest in sharing their story. And, and also traditionally, and we'll see how kind of how this plays out in the future, but a particular editor or project lead will have relationships with, with narrator communities or as a part of that narrator community. Um, and that will help us uh, connect with and locate and build relationships with narrators through a particular project lead. Um, although that idea, as I mentioned, is really, really expanding um, and it's going to over the next year or two. Um, but we're, we're really lucky in, in, in nurturing the relationships um, and having that. And, and Ella likes to use the phrase moving at the speed of trust. And so by the time we get around to the point where would you like to participate in a voice of witness book project? Are you interested in being a narrator? There's clarity of intention. You know the relationship is, is is solid and there's people have a sense of what they might be getting involved in and why and how it might benefit them and how it might be mutually beneficial for their for them individually for their community uh and for voice of witness and in, in centering their story and getting their story out in the world so um that's that's a, a part of it back to the original question as well what are the ways that this work touches other people that are involved like the students or as you may you know perhaps what you hope for with readers um, you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I think educators and students, of course, gain a lot about the experiences of people they may never have interacted with through our stories. You know, if you live somewhere where you don't always get an opportunity to meet a Puerto Rican and hear about their experience with climate change on their homes, or 
and undocumented youth. You know, these are opportunities to read about their experiences firsthand from, you know, the way they're seeing it, the way they're interacting with the world. But beyond that, it's, I think our methodology goes so much further than just the content in the stories. And when students in particular interact with these first person narratives, they're not just learning about the individual in the book, but they're also realizing that narrators come in all forms and they themselves can be narrators and their stories are valuable too. Their family's stories are valuable. Their community stories are valuable. And it's sometimes just that no one's asked the right question. So when people, especially in the classroom, interact with our lesson plans, interact with the books, they're really getting a chance to dive into what does it mean to be an oral historian? What does it mean to tell your story? What does it mean to hold our stories? And what does it mean to make space for all of these stories? So it's not just, you know, we picked up a book on this topic and we're learning about this, but also our resources include, you know, how do you want to do your own oral history project? What theme and what issue is really important to you and your community? And how can we get those stories, those opinions, those experiences out into the world? So it's, it's like an extension of, you know, we've, we've learned to be empathic toward this one person's narrative. And now we're learning to show ourselves and our families and our community that same empathy and understanding that we are all valuable. We are all storytellers here and it's just finding the right time. Um, just to add on to what Aaron was saying that, um, it, you know, it's so, it's so rare that, that students, a lot of students and particularly uh, students and teachers who are part of our narrator communities feel like their lives and their experiences are part of their school experience. They're part of the curriculum. And so this is an opportunity for them to go, oh, what, you know, who I am and my experiences have, have value. And there's a lot of teaching and learning within me you know, that I can express in our methodology, I think really helps to, helps to unlock that as well. Well, um, I'm I was just going to add too, you know, we've been talking a little bit about our community partners who are people who are really engaged in that direct advocacy and direct service on behalf of narrator communities. And often as we're, you know, building partnerships and relationships with our community partners, um, a lot of them are really interested in storytelling. They definitely see you know, the, the importance and the meaning of storytelling and how it connects to their advocacy work and their community building, but often like they haven't had the capacity in the past to engage in storytelling projects or embark on that. And so I think, you know, there's, there, when, when they get to work with, you know, the Voice of Witness series or our storytelling resources, or we do different workshops with them and consultancies, it's a chance for them to be able to um, you know, one, you know, maybe utilize the actual narratives that are in our book for some of their, you know, their advocacy campaigns and things like that. But also it's an opportunity for them to, whether it's like a, you know, a smaller scale workshop or a larger, like their own oral history project to engage in the stories with their community and amplify the stories that are, that are reflected in their community members as well. Um, and also in, in terms of our readers, you know, in each of the Voice of Witness books, at the end of the book, we have a list called 10 Things You Can Do, um, which lists different actions that people, the readers can take um, if they are, you know, and we hope they are, they're moved by the stories, by the generosity of the narrators and sharing their experiences and their lives. Um, readers can engage with that list of things that they can do, which range from, you know, getting like volunteering or getting involved with like local initiatives that support narrator communities or important, um, important things that they're fighting for in their own communities or like contacting their Congress people or just continuing to learn about this issue in a nuanced way. So we really hope that people are not just, you know, moved by the stories, but that really sparks continued solidarity and action. It's great that you offer that as a, how to, what, what you can do. I think people want to be able to feel like they know what they can do next, not just here's here, a, a challenging situation, but that they can even be part of addressing it. That, that's terrific. A lot of ripple effects that you're describing. Our next question is, uh, how does this work intersect with the principles of the Universal Dec Declaration of Human Rights and Human Rights Education? I can start off with this one. Um, I think, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I think one of the first words, and I think it's probably the word that's repeated more often in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is dignity. And, and human dignity and the support of, of dignity and the right you know, to be seen as a person and have dignity. And I think a lot of what Ella and Aaron ha 
we're describing, whether they're with narrator communities, narrators, narrator communities, or teachers and students who are part of our narrator communities and part of our network, all of these resources and all of these activities and these experiences and impact is really about dignity and advancing the, the, the dignity of, of every, you know, my story matters. I, I deserve to be listened to. I deserve to be seen. I deserve to be seen as a whole person, as a human, you know, a full human person. And as Ella was saying, I am not just my my trauma or my, my difficulty or my challenge is not the sum total of who I am. You know, I deserve to be seen as, as a complete and complex and nuanced human person, just just like everybody. Um, and I think that's that's a part of it. And as I mentioned earlier, some of the you know, in our core program areas around the justice system in the United States and migration and displacement, you know, I think of some of the specific articles in the UDHR that are uh, expressing ideas around, you know, freedom of movement um, and the ability to seek asylum. You know, a lot of the stories in our book series and a lot of the resources that we're creating are addressing those content areas that are directly um, direct articles in the, in the UDHR. Um, and so I also think, too, that our work connects with human rights education and, and the UDHR are around the fact that the UDHR was created by people from different legal and cultural backgrounds and coming together in a nuanced way and kind of looking at a, a much more humanistic uh, approach to to creating uh, dignity and human rights as opposed to you know one particular group you know being listened to and one particular group uh, having power and dictating and telling the story for everybody else. So I think I think about that, too. And I also think about our work and human rights education in the UDHR is about social progress. And I think that's what we're trying to tap into through education, through storytelling, through our book series, through our partnering, through our relationships. So those are as I was reflecting on that question, those are a couple of things that came to mind. But um, I know there's certainly more that that Aaron and Ella could mention too. Yeah, I think our books and the lesson plans in particular definitely point out places where our narrators often see their human rights being violated and see places where the UDHR oh. has not been followed and where there's opportunities for real change. And I think it's not just about having students in particular see the rights being broken, but rather thinking, what can we do about it? And why is this so terrible? Not just knowing that it's a rule that's been broken, but rather, why is this rule so important in the first place? Why does it matter that we have these human rights? And what does that look like in my own community, You know, where maybe someone in my neighborhood is unhoused and they've lost that right to, to shelter? What does that mean for that person? What does that mean for all of us that we see this happening? And what can we as a community come together and do about it and do for each other? Because knowing that as we are reading these stories, as we're sharing our own stories and experiencing this, these things could happen to anyone and we're not immune from any of these issues. So it's, it's really about not just learning what are the rights, what do those look like, and what do they look like when they're broken, but rather what do those look like? in different scenarios and not just assuming it's something that happens to other people somewhere else and how can we take action i think just connected to that um you know I, especially what aaron's saying about it's not just something that happens to other people i think that's inherently built into um, the literary approach that we have a voice of witness where we're really striving for immersive sensory detail when someone shares their story and we follow a birth to present day format so i think very intentionally we're not wanting to share just really quick snippets or excerpts or sound bites, which are often shared in like traditional journalism outlets. Um, we really want to provide an opportunity for someone to immerse themselves fully in someone's experience um, and kind of understand their, their whole life and see them as, as a person. And I think that's a way to really build empathy and build that connection of seeing like this is, an, is another person um, living their life and wanting the best for themselves and their loved ones, just like we all are. I think it's great that you're actually, you know, being able to bring out, as you said, Erin, that it's not just being, you know, perhaps disappointed at the breaking of the rules or the breaking of the rights, but to, and not to lose, I guess, hope in their aspirational value, but to actually see, let's take a look at what we can do to have these rights realized. I think that's, um, that's a challenge in this, in the work of just explaining human rights. A lot of times people will say, oh, 
what's the point of learning this? They don't, they're not working anyway. And I think uh, being able to point out that there is this standard to which people should be living and what can we do to make that happen is really vital. I just, I think as, as our fourth question, um, what, what would you want community members and leaders to know about why the work of Voice of Witness is important and how they can help further the work? I think one um, phrase I think we, we mentioned before, I just wanna um, bring it up again, is really emphasizing um, and, and positioning our narrators as the experts. That our narrators are the experts of their own experience and they are the experts on these different social justice and human rights issues. And often if we think about who gets, a, gets the opportunity or who gets access to a platform, especially a mainstream platform to tell their story or to speak out, it's often not those who are most directly impacted by these issues like our narrators. And so we really want to challenge our readers and other people who might be engaging in our content to think about like who, who is getting the mic and who isn't, who is telling their story and who is not getting that chance. Um, and to really rethink the, the way we think about these narratives and to really view our, narr our narrators as the experts and the people who, um, you know, who are, have the direct experience and so should be listened to the most to, um, you know, amplify, to, to amplify solutions. Um, and, and to really question, you know, how often is there a story about a narrator community, but never actually by, you know, that story isn't actually told by a narrator community. It's about them, but it's not by them. Um, so I think that's, I think that's a, a core thing we want people to, to take away from our work. Yeah, and related to that, I think we really want people to understand that there is power in listening to someone's experience, to listening to that expert share with us what they've learned, what they've taught others, what they want us to know from their own experience. And I think we can see that right now because they wouldn't be trying to ban books if they didn't think the books had power in them. And if they didn't think those stories were going to make a difference in someone experiencing it for the first time, someone feeling validated for the first time, someone learning about it for the first time. So there's a lot of power in just experiencing an oral history and then there's a lot of power in doing it for yourself, doing it for your own families and your own communities. And that's what we hope to put out there is we love our work. We love doing our work and we love putting out our books, but we also like putting out lots of resources for folks to do it on their own and to hold that experience of listening to someone so intently, carrying their story and sharing it out. So we don't have to be the only ones holding these all the time, but rather we wanna give everyone the tools to do it for themselves, for their communities, and just recognize how much we get out of that process. Uh, and I just wanted to, to reference something that Ella said a little bit earlier about uh, the transformative power of storytelling. Um, and Aaron was mentioning that too, just a moment ago around, you know, these books wouldn't, they wouldn't be trying to ban them if there wasn't power in, in these stories. Um, and that people, people are transformed by stories. It's like, that's, that's the beginning. Like that's, that's an opening. That's the point of entry. Uh, for people to become involved and to have their thinking complicated in ways that we feel are really, really useful. Because I think the simplicity with which mainstream narrative uh, are articulating the stories and experiences of, of particular communities is woefully inadequate and it's, it's thoroughly incomplete. And so I think through oral history and through, through the transformative power of these stories and, and first person narrative, um, people kind of say, wow, I had no idea or that never occurred to me before, or I've never met somebody from this community or somebody who's experienced that, but there's something about their experience that I can relate to. And I think it's about a connection, being able to make any kind of connection and to build like an empathic bond. And, and also I just wanted to mention, and this is something that we're trying to counter in our work, you know, as part of the so what, um, we have a, a quote that we like to share from the writer Arundhati Roy. And she says, there's no such thing as the voiceless. There's only the, the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. And so I think that a lot of our work and our resources and our stories and our commitment to narrators is connected to that idea and how, how to embody that and how to you know, bring that into the world in a very tangible way. That's a great quote to, for all of us to think about. I love her work. I think she's 
extremely powerful. If people assume we have a, a, a nice audience watching the, this discussion, how could people, how would you like people just in the general public to get more involved? Well, I think we definitely want folks to, to read the books. I think that's like really important is to, you know, get a copy of the book, whether that's through, you know, supporting a local bookstore or through a publisher Haymarket or through the local library. Um, really hope folks will will read these books and, and read them, read an entire collection too, because the, nar the narratives um, are often, you know, there's, there's a lot of connections between them, but they're also complement each other and are very different too. So we encourage people to, to, to you know, read an entire, read an entire book and sit with those stories. Um, so I think reading the books, sharing the books too, spreading the word, you know, if you do, if you do like the book or one of our books, um, share it with somebody else, um, you know, buy a copy for someone else. Um, I think also, you know, we are a small nonprofit. So if people are able to, um, you know, donate or contribute financially um, to our organization, that helps a lot. That helps us do specific programming, like with our community partners, like with um, the education program. Aaron mentioned the Sharing History Initiative, which, you know, gives class sets of free books to, to, um, to educators um, in our narrator communities and in classrooms. And so we, we that, that runs off of support and from donation. So I think those are some some really key ways that can help us continue our work. Um, yeah, Erin and Cliff, I don't know there's some other things you want to mention too. Yeah, those donations also help fuel all the free resources we do have on our website that, you know, are primarily geared toward classrooms, but really anyone, especially in like a community activist setting can access them and use them to tell their own stories. And that's a way of furthering our work as well. It's not just the stories we've collected, although we hope you'll experience them and fall in love with all these narrators as we have, but also recognizing that you have stories to tell, you want to keep passing on this work and our methodology and infusing that into your everyday life would help us keep that movement, that power, that act of listening going forward. And I just wanted to, to mention one thing too, where we're, we're talking about, you know, a small but mighty nonprofit. Um, one of the other things that we do is, uh, as I, we, we talked about a little bit earlier, consulting with uh, other nonprofits, outside organizations, you know, we've worked with folks in other aspects of, of human rights or the legal profession or the medical profession that really see value in harnessing and utilizing our methodology. And as Aaron, Aaron was mentioning, you know, building capacities for listening, whether it's a human an HR thing for an organization, or there's a particular project, a storytelling project that was related to an education or advocacy uh, idea that an organization wanted to promote and get involved with, but didn't necessarily have the skills or the training or the experience uh, to create a, a storytelling, you know, advocacy-based social justice storytelling project or any any kind of storytelling project that is amplifying, you know, unheard voices in, in whatever way. Um, that's part of an opportunity for us too, is, is an earned income stream. Um, so that's if, if, you know, asking people to help spread the word around that aspect of our work as well. So we can really, we're really broadening the application of our methodology that, that really expands our notions of what, what social justice really is. I think though we said it was four questions and we, you've certainly described so beautifully the important work of Voice of Witness. Is there anything else you want to say that we didn't capture in our in our questioning. Is there any, any closing comment you, you want people to think about with regard to voice of witness work? It feels really cliche to say this, but I do think now more than ever, it's become more important to sit down and listen to each other and be really mindful about who we're constantly making space for. And as that Arundhati Roy quote said, who we're deliberately silencing or choosing not to listen to and how are we making sure that the people who are most impacted by these ongoing issues that we're seeing every day and that are experienced by people everywhere you know none of us are actually immune to climate change none of us are forever protected from issues of migration or displacement. None of us are that far from the criminal justice system and recognizing who do we need to listen to that we haven't yet heard and how can we do that? And where are the places we can look for that? And where are the places we can force that into the conversation? 
And we hope that Voice of Witness is forcing spaces wherever we can for those voices to be heard. But we also hope that everyone's doing that in their everyday lives as well. You know, I just wanted to, to add on to that too, that there's um, having opportunities for us to like embrace and actually do what what our what our mission you know embodying what what's in our mission and our values and i think opportunities like this um for us to listen to each other um these two organizations to listen and to to collaborate and actively kind of show that they're that that listening has power and that there there is uh listening creates opportunities for action and solidarity um, and I think for us in, in human rights and social justice work and storytelling, all these things come together, but we also have to demonstrate it ourselves. We have to walk, walk that talk. And I think this, uh, an experience like this and spending time in this conversation is an opportunity to do that. I'm really glad to hear that. Ella, do you have any closing words you'd like to say? Um, I think I think Cliff and Aaron um, summed it up pretty nicely. I don't know, did I already share the story center quote that I like? I can't remember if I shared yeah. that. Okay, I think I was gonna share it at one point and then I lost that thought. But um, there's a quote that I, that I really like that um, story center in Berkeley uses, which is that the shortest distance between two people is a story. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's just, that I think really resonates a lot with our work and our mission um, in so many ways. And I hope people, um, yeah, remember that as they, you know, think about ways to maybe engage with voice of witness in our work, but I think it's also applies to us today having this conversation. I'm really grateful that we've been able to do this and I hope that our that the result of this conversation that we can post about or get the word out about is a start of, of some really ripple has some ripple effect to see how people can think about work that's being done and how they how it affects them as well. Because I think what you're doing, you're, you know, you're touching a lot of people directly involved, but as you pointed out, Aaron, we're all connected to the issues that your stories are telling. And for us to realize the interconnectedness of that of this, interconnectedness of this is, is vital. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you for giving us this opportunity. Uh, thank you so and thank much. Thank you, Jasmine. <laughs> Thank you for holding this space, Jasmine. <laughs>